to welcome all of you. Um, I know you've been being welcomed all along, but this is your official welcome. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to North Madison Congregational Church in Diaspora. Um, we've had some strange and wonderful blessings in this time of COVID um, in worshiping remotely like this. We've gotten to see the inside of one another's homes, which is kind of fun. But more than that, we've been able to connect with gifts and graces and musical talents and the wonderful presence and creativity of this congregation. And we've been able to reflect um, more deeply in some ways about some of the things happening in the world today. So we hold the, the challenges of this time <clears throat> together with the blessings. And that's sort of the theme of this morning's worship service. And um, here to lead us in that service, we have Linda Giuliani, our music maven, <clears throat> who's been working hard on doing music in all kinds of new ways and has finally worked up with Scott Chaffee and our new friend Jack, how to do worship um, music virtually. So you'll see some more of that this morning. And we have Orlean Wayland, who is our virtual deacon in charge of um, joys and concerns today. So she'll tell you some more of that. And Sandy Dixon, our virtual deacon in charge of behind the scenes operations of the Zoom. So if you have any trouble, you can reach out to Sandy and she'll keep an eye on things. And then Jackson, who's not pictured at the moment, but we'll be right back, is our junior deacon who will lead us in our morning prayer. There he is. Hi, Jackson. Uh, so um, I have some announcements for you. After worship today, we will do our fellowship hour again. So if you would like to come on to the live fellowship, just accept the invitation that'll pop up on your screen. If you don't want to be visible, that is fine. Don't accept the invitation. You'll still see us and hear us. We just won't see you. So if you're in your jammies and you don't want to be seen, that's A-OK. -okay. If you're in your jammies and you want to be seen, that's A-OK -okay too. So um, our summer worship is a little bit more contemplative. We have some contemplative pieces added. So watch for those. But if you have a story or a poem or a song or a prayer that you'd like to share with us in worship, please let us know. We'd love to include you in the offerings that we share each Sunday. So with that, I'm gonna let um, Orlean unmute and take it from here with our announcements as I fight with Facebook a little bit more. So excuse me for just a moment. Okay, thank you, Heather. Good morning to everyone who is out there. And on behalf of the deacons, I warmly, and I use that phrase loosely, especially today, welcome you to this morning's service. Um, hoping that you're sitting in a nice, cool spot, maybe on your porch, uh, with a nice coffee or whatever pleases you. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping um, questions. If you want to use the chat, I think that most of you are familiar with it. Um, Please feel free to do that, but if you can refrain um, during Heather's message, that would be really helpful um, because we've kind of come to the conclusion that uh, using the chat during a service is a little bit like whispering when you're in the pews. So um, if you can hold on those, and if you have a joy or concern, if you can put the word joy or concern in all caps, um, that would be really helpful to me so I can catch them when it's time and also, um, just from a privacy perspective, if, if, you, um, if you care to name someone, that's great, but maybe uh, don't put in last names uh, because this is a, this is a public site. Um, and also, um, I've been asked to do greetings to Facebook. Um, I'm not very familiar with it, so thank you, Heather, for my script. Uh, just start a watch party to boost us so those looking for us can find us here. Um, and also, Sandy mentioned earlier, uh, please check your spam if you're not getting emails from the church office. And my thanks to Sandy for being my behind the scenes um, techno person. Uh, it's very helpful. Um, also, if you are interested, um, a new member class is forming. Um, so please do let us know. And also, um, I just want to mention that everything we give to this church community in any form 
continues, and especially right now, continues to be really important. And I think on behalf of all of us, the deacons, others, um, we just want to say thank you for reaching out to people, neighbors, friends. It continues to be, I think for so many, a, a, a challenging time. There's a lot of decisions to be made. Do I, don't I? Um, so it's been tough. And also for continuing to send financial support to keep our staff going, to keep our ministries going, to keep this church community going. Um, there is a link in the chat. I'll be posting that shortly uh, that you can use to give directly to the website. Kind of cuts the detail out of having to write a check and put it in the mail. It's really easy. Uh, you can set up a recurring gift as a sustaining member. And it really is an easy way because every time we do that, we continue to ensure that our church is supported. And that's a really important thing, too. Um, just a really quick update. Um, there is a group that has come together um, to really look at the whole issue of safety of our members and use of the building. We'll continue to worship in this format um, through the summer. And are really the group is actually looking for criteria in terms of um, a safe opening whatever that might be. Um, so rest assured that they're looking at all of the current guidelines and having conversations to be sure that the safety and well-being of our membership is first and foremost. Um, we still have about 20, we believe, signs. They're $10 and you can pick them up at a social distance at the church. Rhonda, who's our newest member, um, member of the staff, our new bookkeeper. Um, her, her morning hours are posted in the Friday newsletter. You can come and pick up the signs. It's also a great way to meet her from afar and say hello. So that's all I have for the deacon's welcome and would like you to listen with me um, for our gathering acknowledgement. Welcome to worship. We begin the morning by acknowledging those upon whose ancestral lands our church building rests. We acknowledge the peoples who lived in the area that's now called Madison. The Pequots, the Mohegans, the Mahamanassets, the Menenkadex, and I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, and the Quinnipiacs. We acknowledge their loving stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We also acknowledge the peoples indigenous to other lands who were kidnapped, brought here against their will, and forced to work for generations, building the wealth of this nation in inhumane conditions without compensation. May we live with respect on this land and in healing partnership with all God's people, mindful of these histories and our current responsibilities. And let us now be in a spirit of worship. Jackson. Thank you, Arlene, and um, I invite all our worship leaders to mute, except for Jackson, who, as Arlene said, will be leading us in our morning prayer. In this season of summer, we are studying different approaches to prayer and spirituality, and so this morning we will pray the Jewish morning prayer um, for us. So let our hearts be united in a spirit of worship as Jackson, our junior deacon, leads us in our morning prayer. I offer you my gratitude, ever-living and enduring God. You restore my soul to me today. 
How great is your compassion, how great is your trust in me. I open myself to the miracle in this gift of day. Although my world changes constantly, your enduring and eternal spirit is moving through it all. I open myself to be seen, known, loved, and fully accepted by you and your great mystery as it embraces me today. When I experience your faith in me, O loving God, I glimpse a view of the most expansive perspective. In that glimpse, I am calmed. I relax my frantic grip. I let go of trying to figure it out. I begin to trust the inevitable flow of change. As you see me, O oh God, I surrender to your trusting gaze. Your faith in me grows my faith. When I am known, seen, and loved completely, I can dare to rise to the challenges of loving this world with all that I am and everything I've got. Amen. wonderful world <clears throat> but it's also a complicated one and uh, sometimes it's our resistance to those complications that can make the world seem a little less wonderful so this morning as we light our meditation candle we're going to breathe in all that's good and breathe out all the schmutz all the shadows all the things that are, aren't so good remembering that they're all part of the journey that we're on together with God. So as we prepare for this candle time, 
I invite us all to sit quietly. Notice your body. Feel the places that it hurts or is a little creaky today. Feel the places that it feels good and flowing. And as you settle into your body, I invite you to take a good deep breath. Breathe in the light of God. And then breathe out all that is shadowy and schmutzy inside of you. Breathe in deeply this light, the light that stretches across the universe that lives in your soul. And breathe out all of the shadowed places where it feels like the light can't reach. Breathe in God's light. Breathe out all the schmutz, all your worries, all the darkness. Gently continue focusing on the light, feeling its, its gentle glowing in your heart, feeling that light spread all across your body through every cell of you. Breathe in the light, breathe out all that is not light. Breathe in the light. Breathe out all that is not light. All your worries and your cares, breathe them out. All your griefs, breathe it out. <clears throat> Keep breathing at your own pace. In God's light, and out everything else that gets in the way of that light. The mind wanders, just focus on the candle again. And now that it's gone, we thank God for the peace of our breathing, the gentleness of this time. Amen. <clears throat> so now we turn to our children's story time. And um, it's me that's sharing this children's time today. So. I have just a little story, and I think it's for us who are children of all ages, really. We are all children of all ages. <clears throat> um, I want to tell you a story about a tree, and it, it's a very special tree to me. It was a tree that I learned about when I lived in West Africa. <clears throat> now, I don't know how many of you have ever been to West Africa or even know where it is on a map. Maybe later you can find it. But I lived in a little country in West Africa called Togo. <clears throat> it looks like pizza to go, but without the space between the two and the go. <laughs> Togo, West Africa. And I'd never heard of the place before I lived there. But it's a really cool place. And if you ever have a chance to visit, you should go. In fact, we're talking about as a church, when all this COVID mess is under control and we can travel again, we're talking about visiting the country right next door to Togo called Ghana, where we have some friends who have lived there and who are there right now as missionaries to the United Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ. And so we may go when this all um, comes off and, um, and enjoy learning about Ghana and Togo ourselves and meeting some new friends there, <clears throat> see what God's up to in that part of the world. But in the meantime, when I lived in Togo, in the beginning of my time, I lived down um, where the water meets the continent of West Africa on the coast. And it was a wonderful place to live. But then I moved all the way to the tippity top of Togo, the northern part of Togo, to a place called Dapong. And I lived in a little village um, that was part of the Dapong region called Naki West, Nakintindi it was called. <clears throat> and in Nakintindi, I lived in a little round hut with a Little thatched roof. Well, actually, my family had little round huts and roofs. I lived in a square building that was right next door, but it was still kind of round with them. And anyway, we um, had a wonderful life there, and it it was a special place 
there was a water hole near my house where we would go with our big metal bowls. We'd put them on our heads and we'd carry them down to the water to fill them up at the water hole. And the first word I learned in the local language, which is called Nova, was the word nyebak. Nyebak. You know what nyebak means? It means crocodile. Because in that water hole lived a crocodile. And the little boy that I lived with was the first thing he told me, nyebak bay, there's a crocodile in here. <laughs> so be careful. <clears throat> So we lived there and we would travel around. I had a bicycle and I had friends that I would go around with and we would visit people's homes and we would um, build gardens and we would plant trees and we would dig wells and we would play together and talk together and work together and live together, go to the market. <clears throat> we had a wonderful time. And when I would travel around with my friend Cumbledall on our bicycle, visit other friends in other villages, we would go along these paths that went through the African brush. And along the paths, there were these special trees that I want to tell you about. They were called baobab trees. And these trees were like mountains. I've never, I can't even tell you, these trees were enormous. You couldn't reach all the way around them. I don't think a few people holding hands could reach all the way around a baobab tree. <clears throat> they were huge. And they went all along the path. And one day I said to Cumbledall, Cumbledall, it's amazing, these trees, and who planted them all along the paths? And Cumbledall said, well, people didn't plant these trees. I said, well, okay, I understand God plants every tree. I understand. He goes, no, 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 God does plant the tree. But I'm not saying that. People didn't plant the trees. The elephants planted the trees. I said, what? He said, yeah, the paths that we ride on our bicycles are the elephant paths. And the elephants made the paths, so we just use them. And the elephants planted the trees. I said, well, come along, I'm not trying to understand you. I don't think I've ever seen an elephant plant a tree. <laughs> and he said, well, it's true. And here's what he meant. Forever, human beings were trying to figure out how they could cultivate baobab trees. And if you know anything about seeds, Sometimes you can just get a little seed packet and shake out some seeds and put them in the ground and water them and they'll grow. But sometimes you have to help the seed because its casing is so hard and so tough that even if you plant it, just watering it and having some sunshine won't be enough for that seed to grow. And in the case of the baobab tree, when people tried to figure out how to plant them, make them grow, how to cultivate them, People couldn't figure it out. They tried everything. What if we boil the seed first? What if we put it in some acid? What if we crack it open just a little bit? What if we try freezing it and then boiling it? What can we do to plant this, get this seed to germinate? Well, the elephants had it all figured out. Because the way you plant a baobab tree is that an elephant has to eat some of its seed. Elephants love baobab seeds. They're big and they're fluffy. And the elephants would chop on the fluffy part around the hard shell. And when the elephant ate the delicious, to the elephant, delicious baobab seed, it would go into the elephant. And it would go all through the elephant's digestive tract until guess where it ended up? Out in the elephant's poop. <laughs> and that elephant poop, after having that seed has gone all through the tract of the elephant, that seed had been doused in the elephant's digestive juices and squeezed and pushed out. And that poop that it got pushed out in became fertilizer. And then the seed could grow. And so elephants plant the baobab trees. And the baobab trees grow big and tall to shade the paths that the elephants walk as they walk through the brush. And then to shade the paths and guide the people from village to village who follow the paths that the elephants made and walk in the shade of the trees that the elephants planted. It's a pretty good story, isn't it? You'd never guess. Yeah. Well, I think that has to do with our scripture today, which we'll hear in a minute, about how sometimes it's the unexpected difficulties in our lives that bring the unexpected blessings. Because I'm betting that when those seeds got eaten up by those elephants, they never dreamed. They thought their lives were over. They never dreamed that they would become, from elephant poop, such a majestic, amazing tree. So let's 
our story for today. Pretty cool story, right? So thank you for listening. And here is Linda with our scripture. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 to 29. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. And while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, an enemy has done this. The slaves said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in the gathering the, of the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Linda. So, we opened worship today with uh, a Jewish prayer, a prayer that is to be said in the morning, each morning, um, if you're a Jewish person, and uh, a prayerful one. And it's a prayer that's meant to um, remind us that, as uh, one rabbi I was reading as I prepared for today said, um, we're not to wake up each morning with the thought, oi, another day, everything's wrong, everything's wrong. We're to welcome each day with a prayer of gratitude, an acknowledgement of the gift that the day is to us. We're to open each day with a sense of being grateful. We are here and all of life is a gift, the ups and the downs. They're a gift. They're a gift. And so when um, Linda chose What a Wonderful World for us to hear this morning in our song, I thought what a wonderful pairing of this passage and that song. Because while it's a beautiful song, it just on the surface seems wonderful. What a wonderful world. Really, when you know more about that song, you get a richer understanding of what it's all about. Because you may or may not know that it wasn't Louis Armstrong that wrote that song. It was two Jewish songwriters that wrote it. And they looked to Louis Armstrong as, well, as an ambassador. Because in the time it was written in 1968, I believe, our country and the world was in quite a bit of turmoil. We had war. We had lots of activist movements springing up all over the place in this country and in others. There was a lot of unrest and uncertainty. Racial conversations were charged. Conversations between genders were charged. A lot was happening in the world. And so this song was meant to be a commentary, an invitation, not to focus on all that was wrong, but to remember that in the midst of all that was wrong, it was our doing that made it wrong. And it was our opportunity to make it right. So for these two Jewish men to write this song and then ask Louis Armstrong, a black man in the midst of such, of all that was happening with civil rights and the civil rights unrest, it was an important moment, an important combination of people to tell the nation and the citizens of it that story. The world is a beautiful place and we have the possibility of making it more beautiful. We really do. Louis Armstrong, though, no good deed goes unpunished, you know, as they say. Louis Armstrong um, got a lot of pushback about that song. And if you have, there's one particular recording that I have heard quite a lot. I have here somewhere, and you may have heard it too. At the beginning of the song, I think it's the beginning, you hear Louis Armstrong say in his gravelly, beautiful voice, uh, some of you young folks been saying to me, hey, Pop, what do you mean, what a wonderful world? How about all them wars all over the place? 
You call them wonderful? But how about listening to old pops for a minute? Seems to me it ain't the world that's so bad, but what we're doing to it. And all I'm saying is, see what a wonderful world it would be if only we'd give it a chance. Love, baby. Love. That's the secret. He was a wise man. And his message was made even more powerful because you can't separate that message from the messenger. Sometimes we go through the hoop of life, right? We go through the digestive tract of the elephant. And when we're expelled and we feel like we're in the midst of a pile of poop, is exactly the place we are meant to be because we learn how difficult, how tight the squeeze can be in life. And it's from there, it's that that fertilizes us so that we can grow into what can be one of the most beautiful, amazing, life-giving versions, iterations of ourselves we could ever be and maybe could ever have imagined. Our passage today is about that. I just gave us the little beginning part for Linda to read today because I just want to focus on that important thought. Someone sows seeds, good seeds, and someone else sows seeds that are weeds. Now, gardeners know, and you've heard it in our Tuesdays in the Garden, I'm sure, what's a weed? It's just something growing where you don't want it to. So who's the weed from different people's perspective? That's always, that's always a negotiation. To the weed, they're not a weed. To the weed, they're living the life that they've been given. And hopefully they're grateful and enjoying that life. But sometimes weeds, those people, ideas, things are planted in the world. They start to suck the life out of us. When you think about plants, they have competing roots, and the roots can draw nourishment away from one another. Although sometimes, when you have intermingled roots, you can help provide more nutrients for one another. One of the other things I learned in West Africa on those bike rides with my friend Cumbledall, we would go to do farming together, and we would talk about rotating our crops or planting some crops in among other crops because one crop will put nitrogen in the ground, for example, to make the other crop stronger. One crop, crop will cover the ground to hold down the weeds to let the other crop grow up into the sun. If we only look at the crops growing among us and aren't us as weeds, well, we miss a lot of opportunities to benefit from the things that others bring that we wouldn't have otherwise. That's part of the message of Louis Armstrong's song and the two men who wrote it, is that Jewish folks in the world have often been seen as a weed. In fact, we see that in the scripture as well. I think more often than not, when I read this passage growing up, I always thought, I'm the good crop, right? And the weeds that are planted among me, well, those are the bad people, the bad things in life that get in the way, that harm me, that make life harder. But I'm the good crop. But in the Jewish story, I'm not sure that's true at all because the Jewish people understood the story of the mustard seed, right? The mustard seed, well, a mustard plant's a weed from a lot of people's perspective. It's a weed that grows up and takes over. And to come from this tiny, tiny little seed that almost you can't notice into a giant bush it takes over the landscape is a surprise. It's a miracle. That's part of the story that such a tiny seed has the faith to grow into something it's hard to imagine can live from such a tiny seed. But also, such a tiny seed planted, smushed into the ground. Being smushed into the ground doesn't kill it. It plants it and it grows. And it goes from a little bit of nothing into a big, big living opportunity for change. It creates shade. It creates a habitat for birds and things to come and live in. It creates leaves that can be eaten. So 
a wonderful life-giving thing. But if you just toss it away because it's too small and too nothingy, you miss out on all the richness they can bring to life. The Jewish people had that story because that was part of their identity. They were the little bit of nothing that the wider world around them did not want. They were the people that had been enslaved, had been pushed into exile. They were the people that other more wealthy, more powerful, more important people just tossed away. But they didn't give up on themselves. They went through terrible trials. They went through essentially going through the digestive tract of an elephant, of the people. And it strengthened them. They learned from the journey. And you see in their scripture, our scripture, the wisdom that grew in that time. Because there are passages in our scripture that say things like, you were in exile. When you were a stranger, you know what that suffering was like. So you remember and you welcome the stranger. You welcome the immigrant among you. You know how awful it is to be that little seed that someone has thrown away or tried to squish underfoot. You remember that. And you welcome others. Let your experience, let your survival be in you as you welcome each new day with gratitude. I am still here. I am here. I was never alone. There's a wonderful saying, they tried to bury us, but they did not know we were seen, right? There's so many things in life that try and bury us. As a people, many of us experience that, and that's why we have all these protest movements, because all those people are saying, we are seeds, and we're going to flourish, and we're going to grow. We're going to show you all that we have to offer. And people come around and say, yes, and I'm going to protect you so you can flourish and grow. Because without you, our lives, our garden, our world would be so much less. You're not a weed at all. You're a wonderful nitrogen-fixing plant that's a gift to create the habitats and life, nourishment, shade for others. That's what all these movements are about. But there are other things in life, too, that aren't movements, that are moments, that come into the lives of all of us, even the most so-called privileged folks. We live with a lot of pain, people that don't love us in the ways we need to be loved, illnesses that strike us, the people we love. We live with the worries that we can't provide the way we'd like to, we can't live out our dreams, we worry about whether we can feed our children, whether we can ever retire, where we're going to live. We worry about sending our kids back to school at the end of this summer. Will it be safe? Where will we be with COVID then? We worry about how we can keep our small businesses, our finances going in the midst of COVID. We worry about so many things, big and small. Is this the right relationship for me? Should I be in it? If I don't stay in this relationship, will there ever be another? How hard should I push my kids? Should I trust their pace? Or should I double down and make sure that they learn, even if it harms our relationship right now? What risks are the good risks to take and which ones are not? We worry about so many things. These are, these are all those weeds in our lives. What we'd like is for somebody to just pull them out. And I have said that to people more often than not. I wish I had fairy dust that I could sprinkle in your life as you suffer right now and make it all go away. Because it's so hard to sit with each other's pain when we're in the midst of it. It just is. Almost harder sometimes than sitting with our own. But this is a spiritual journey we're on in life, not just a physical journey. And there really is a gift if we're open to looking at it that way. There's a spiritual journey gift in the weeds in our lives. 
that's maybe even greater than the gift in, well, in the good plants we sow. Because as the scriptures tell us, it's easy to love those who already love us, right? That doesn't help us grow in our love. And it's easy to stay whole when life is calm and gentle and fulfilling. But if we're going to grow as people, if we're going to develop the tenacity and the beauty, the wisdom, the depth that we can, we need a few weeds in our lives. Because it's through living with the weeds that we begin to, well, we become more enriched. Learning to hold more tenaciously to the soil where we're planted. Learning to share resources that we might have hoarded for ourselves. Learning to keep trusting that if we keep reaching up, we're going to find that sun. And that reaching through the branches that would block us from other weedy people, life circumstances, strengthens us in our ability to keep going and our ability to support one another as we each suffer. It's part of the walk of life. So when the helpers in the fields ask the farmer, should we pull out all the weeds now? The farmer responds with wisdom. Let's not pull them out now, because if we pull out the weeds, We'll also pull out the good plants. Fewer weeds might make us grow in some ways or think it will, but there's so much more to our growth than it being easy. There's so much more to our souls that we can't find when life is only easy. Now, I'm not saying that God punishes us and makes life hard so that we grow. I don't believe that. I believe that life just is challenging. And that's how it is on this planet. And so the spirit comes to us with ways of surviving the journey and thriving. We love, and grief is part of our love. If we don't want grief, the only way to not have grief is to not have love. If we pull the weeds out of grief, then we pull the love up with it. Because grief is about relationships about connection. So we have an opportunity in this life to live fully, to let ourselves embrace the digestive tract of the elephant, to know that the weeds in our lives, they're just trying to live their own life too. But they're also the places where if we embrace their presence, we may find the greatest gifts and greatest growth, growth and gift we might not have found otherwise the depth of community and friendship and relationship, eternal fortitude that we find in our times of trouble make life so much richer and so much more beautiful in those times and in the happier times as well. And the lessons we learn from those weeds are lessons that we can share so that when others are suffering, instead of wishing for fairy dust, we can really come and be with them not push their pain away, but be present to their pain, listening and holding and letting them know it's going to be okay. God's with us. Even in the worst of it, there's always something new being born. Even from that pile of poop that the seed thought was the end, it can be the place where the biggest, most majestic tree on the continent can be born. Life is strange. But grief is part of love. Darkness is part of light. Suffering is part of growing. It's a wonderful world. Thanks be to God. And so now I invite Orlean to unmute herself and lead us into our joys and concerns and our time of prayer. Thank you, Heather. Um, we have a few joys and concerns that are out there this morning. It's a really special time in our service where we have, we have the way and the audience to share either publicly or think about a joy, a gratitude 
or a concern that's near and dear to us. So I'm going to start with a joy that came in early in the service from Ingela. And this is a big one. Spent an afternoon with Burke, his brother Tio, and my daughter and husband here in Guilford. Whoopee! So, Ingla, thanks for letting us know about that. And we have a concern. Well, I, this is not listed as a joy, but I'm going to read it. Heartfelt gratitude to the Clemens family. And I think we can all share that. What a beautiful, moving performance. Um, so thank you for doing that. And we have a concern. A close friend is having a knee replaced on Tuesday. Prayers for successful surgery and a quick recovery. We also had a concern, and I'm trying to get back to it, so bear with me. Um, and it was from Sally. And Sally's close friend, Molly Farmer, is very ill and very weak. Please pray for her. And we have more joys from Linda. I will be taking care of my niece's chihuahua for a week and a half. That sounds like fun. Um, from Sue and Jonathan, so grateful I had the opportunity to share time with all three of my boys recently, as well as my dad. That sounds, that sounds like it was fun. From Calvin, thank you, Bill and family, for a beautiful song. From Heather, Heather C., for the bounty of the garden, anyone wants squash? <laughs> Barb said yes. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll be back. From Sandy, for the death of John Lewis, my heart breaks for his family. I Thank hope you. our country raises up his words and brings them to life so we can move towards equality and justice. Yeah, thank and, you for remembering him, Sandy. And, you know, if you haven't yet signed, but you're inclined to want to sign the petition to have the Pettus Bridge renamed for John Lewis, this is a good time. It's all over the internet, so you can find it easily. Um, because, you know, John Lewis was one of those protesters that was beaten within an inch of his life on the Pettus Bridge. So to then rise and have the career that he has had as a fighter for justice of all sorts. Um, it'll be a wonderful honoring. It's time. So thank you for remembering him. Yeah. And, and also the UCC, don't forget his movie is coming out, Good Trouble. And I think, um, I think there was like a donation of $12 if you go on the UCC website to uh, see the movie when it comes out. Thank you. Thank you. And from Robin, thank you, Heather. You weave your messages with scripture brilliantly and with such relevance. Thank you, Robin. I try to keep it interested for all my smart friends here at North Madison Congregational Church. And there was a little footnote on Sandy's uh, post that says, yes, Heather loves squash. <laughs> and on that note, uh, that's all we have. Sandy, I don't know if there's anything out on Facebook, um, but if we can. I don't see anything on Facebook today. Okay. okay. So we have, we have an important prayer to share um, this morning. And um, this, may, this will be a shock for some of you. Um, so, but we, um, Tim wanted you all to know that um, Karen, you know, she fought hard with this cancer and uh, the chemo has been really taking a toll in the last, this last treatment. And last, yesterday she wasn't feeling very well, but she just didn't want to go to the doctor. She was going to see her doctor Monday. Um, but last night she woke up early in the morning in real distress and Tim called 911 and um, they worked on her at the house and transported her to the hospital and she died this morning.
So we hold Tim and um, Karen's mom, Judy, who's been staying with them. So she's had some wonderful time together with Karen and Ryan and Haley all in our prayers and their family in our prayers. Um, Renee Chin has been close to them all the way, walking this journey with them. And so we pray for Renee and her family as well. It's hard to lose a friend too. And so we remember all of them this morning. Um, and uh, they're still regrouping, this is really fresh. So our tendency tends to be to rush in with meals and calls and things. And I think that's wonderful. Right now, let's give them a moment to just breathe. Uh, this was unexpected today. Um, so um, emails I think are good, um, cards are good, and we will keep you posted the minute we have more to share. This will be our first memorial service during COVID time in our church. And so we're gonna need to figure out how to do that meaningfully um, in a way that celebrates Karen and uh, holds her family the best way we can. So uh, we will be watching your emails. We will be in touch as soon as we have things to share. And, um, but in the meantime, your prayers are welcome. And Linda has some prayer shawls for them that I'll bring over later. And um, so we thank you all for the love that you have shared with them all the way, and they will especially need their church family now. So thank you for that. And as we say, you know, we hold our grief with our love. Um, it's part of life. And we hold each other as we walk that journey. So let's be in a spirit of prayer. Holy One, some days are hard, and we feel like we are in that digestive tract of that darn elephant. Let us feel you holding us as well. Let us feel you in the midst of the grief of a young family who's lost their mom, a husband who's lost his, his wife, his life mate, a friend who's lost her bestie, a mom who's lost her daughter all too soon. Hard to hold these things in our hearts, but we are also a community that has walked this journey before, and we know some of its wisdom. And so we thank you for the ways that our own sufferings can be something we can offer gently, wisely, generously to one another so that we need not walk alone. We thank you, God, that for Karen, all suffering is over and her worries about a lingering time with cancer have passed, that death came swiftly and has now passed. And now we pray for her children and all the children who've lost their moms to dads. We pray for the moms and dads who've lost children too soon we pray for the spouses who have had to learn to walk this path of grief, and single parenting, in a space in the bed and at the kitchen table. So many new beginnings to be journeyed through. So help us, God, to let the griefs we've each experienced tune us toward the griefs of others, to hold this family and to hold ourselves. Because as we remember, their grief, we re-experience the griefs in our own lives as well. And help us, God, also to hold on to the joy of each new day. To know that grief is just love for someone we can no longer hold. And so help us to remember to hold those we love now as closely as we can steep ourselves in the gift of the presence of each day and each heart that enters the days we live. We thank you, God, that we know, we know that you know how this is. Your son walked this path as well as did his mom and his siblings and his friends. Grief has been from the first family in creation until ours today, but it doesn't seem to get easier. So hold us and let us grow in our wisdom. Let us grow in our compassion and our empathy and let the Murphys feel our love. Let all who loved Karen feel held and hold all of us as well. We pray these prayers as well 
for the family of our, our fallen leaders, especially those we've lost this week. We pray these prayers as well for those who have no one else praying for them. The folks who die without a family waiting home anxiously for news. We know that each life is precious to you, O oh God, and we pray that we may open our hearts to feel each of our value and all lives valued. We thank you for the gift of this day for all of us who are still here in it. We thank you that we believe that someday we are reunited somehow with you and all the spirits we have loved and lived with and shared with and lost. We pray for Tim and Karen's children that they will feel held. We pray all this in the name of the one who showed us how to live and love and grieve and be a friend. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. strange places and God invites us to grow. We prepare for our shalom, our benediction, 
remember, life is short. We don't have much time to bless the lives of those who make this journey with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the God who loves us and who made us and who makes this journey with us be with us all now and forever. Amen. And blessings on the way. Our worship is ended, friends. So our service may begin. start opening up our um, invitation for you to join us. So, look forward to seeing you. <laughs> 